Good morning, baseball fans, and welcome back to Dan's Vintage Baseball PC. Do not be fooled by that fancy name. It's just me and some friends talking about baseball cards. And the baseball cards we're going to be talking about today are those of Tris Speaker, uh, Hall of Famer, a uh, very near original Hall of Famer, uh, pre-war, uh, perhaps the second best pre-war player. Um, I'm sorry, the second best dead ball era player. We, we forgot about Babe Ruth there for a second. Uh, he's definitely the rival of Ty Cobb, but uh, we'll go through some of the numbers. Uh, he's pretty damn close to Ty Cobb. And our guest today is our old friend Sean, who um, first appeared on this channel in the 1952 Tops show, which, uh, to his credit, is our second most watched show uh, of the 50 videos that we've posted. So Sean is in the top 4%. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, briefly on Tris Speaker, let's do a little bio and then we'll bring Sean out shortly. Whoops, a little preview there. Let's go back. Here's uh, the front page of his baseball reference. Born in Hubbard, Texas in 1888, I think that says. Uh, anyway, so Tris Speaker, born in Texas. Uh, he's a star athlete on his Hubbard High School team and uh, signs up as an eight, 17 year old, as a 17 year old to some, uh, local minor league teams. Um, he actually plays, I guess a year for the, um, it's a Texas polytech in Fort Worth. Uh, Hubbard is about, I don't know, 30 miles South of Dallas. So he's in that general area. Um, he, he's in the Texas North league when the two Texas leagues merge to become the Texas League. He does so well that Boston comes and signs him as an 18-year-old. Uh, he goes up to Boston and plays a little bit in 1907 and isn't very good. So they don't offer him a contract for 1908. But uh, Tris takes it on himself to show up at their uh, spring training in Little Rock, Arkansas. Does well enough for them to say, all right, we're back being interested in you again. So they sell him to the Little Rock minor league team with the condition that um, – if he starts doing really well, Boston has the right to buy it back. And that's what ends up happening. Uh, he shows up in 1908. Uh, he's better. Uh, and by 1909, he is the regular center fielder for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, speaker, we'll go through his stats a little bit. Um, as you can see, uh, I, I'm sorry, 1909, he becomes the regular center fielder. Hits 300, does very well. And by 1912... Uh, he wins the MVP, the Red Sox win the World Series, uh, and he's off uh, as a local hero. In fact, he was kind of a local hero for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, very social player, uh, very good working in the community. And uh, what happens is they win the World Series in 1915, but his average had gone down three years in a row, so they wanted to offer him a, 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 a cut in his salary. Um, so he holds out. And then they trade him to Cleveland. Uh, a 28-year-old uh, traded to Cleveland, becomes the manager of Cleveland, has perhaps his best season in Cleveland uh, in 1916 when he wins the batting title. Uh, he wins a World Series with Cleveland in 1920 uh, and is the toast of the town for many years. Uh, ultimately, what ends up happening to Speaker, uh, well, we'll talk about the end of his career first because I pulled this up. The first time I've ever pulled up this on the stats. These are the top war leaders in baseball history. As you can see, Barry Bonds is number one, but if you talk about players or non steroid players, Babe Ruth is number one. Um, but look who's number six there. Tris Speaker is literally the sixth player in baseball history in terms of career war. The only people ahead of him are Bonds, Ruth, Mays, Cobb, and Aaron. I mean, that's literally the, the Mount Rushmore of, of Major League Baseball. And he's ahead of players like Honus Wagner, Stan Musial, Rogers Hornsby, Ted Williams. I mean, you, you're talking about um, Tris Speaker being perhaps the most underrated player in the history of Major League Baseball because he's a top 10 all-timer, but doesn't really get referred to that way. So anyway, going back to the end of his Cleveland career, uh, what happens is uh, a player by the name of Dutch Leonard, um, not to be confused with the pitcher named Dutch Leonard from much later in the 20th century, uh, Dutch Leonard accuses Speaker and Cobb of throwing a game in 1909. Uh, the 
allegation is proven to be false, but in the interim, both Cobb and Speaker have to resign their positions as managers. Speaker then leaves Cleveland, uh, plays a year in Philadelphia, and then a year in Washington. I think it is. We'll go back to the stats here for a sec. Uh, yeah, he plays, oh, he plays a year in Washington. Then he's in 1928. He's with uh, Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia A's. And if you look at the roster on that team, it's crazy. you got a 40-year-old uh, Eddie Collins, and you've got a 20-year-old Jimmy Fox, uh, and Philadelphia in 29 would become uh, a powerhouse with the young Fox, but uh, Speaker missed the World Series by a year there. He goes to, he ends up uh, managing in Newark and then Kansas City, and uh, he spends a lot of time yeah, basically later in his career. Uh, somebody said, I think it was in his Sabre bio I read, he made a post playing career um, as being Tris Speaker was his career. So he would go to, all different kinds of banquets and um, speaking engagements and coaching. And basically he, he, he played his celebrity up a little bit, but uh, the best part of Trish speakers later career is that he was called back into action in 1948 to um, coach, be the personal coach for Larry Doby. When Larry Doby made his um, premiere with the, um, with the Indians in 1947. And uh, he was, he was tasked with turning Doby from a second baseman into an outfielder, and his task was completed quite successfully. So let's go back to um, full screen here and bring on our guest. Uh, our guest you'll know from the 1952 Tops uh, episode, which, as I said, is our second most watched episode of the 50 that I've done. And Sean is uh, one of our best friends from uh, from the baseball uh, the vintage group in uh, on Twitter, and you'll know them. Uh, um, so, from that and from uh, from the Fifty Two Show. Good morning, my friend. Welcome back. Good morning, Dan. You? I'm good. How are you? So I won't go through your you know your card history and all that because we did that already. But I just want to know, Fifty Two Tops is post war. Tris Speaker is definitely pre war, dead ball era kind of guy. Uh, yeah. Why speaker is the question. Why speaker? Well, you kind of touched on it a little bit there. He's, I think, the most underrated player in the history of baseball. You showed him he's top. I'll put him top five in war. We're going to disqualify Barry Bonds just, just because. But uh, he's that good. He was the first five-tool player in the history of baseball. That's uh, He's got all kinds of records in terms of he got the uh, career doubles record. He's got the career outfield assists record, outfield double plays record. He's... He's all over the field, and he made a difference wherever he played. And, and as you said, too, the, the Larry Doby story really is kind of a powerful one because Tris Speaker grew up in the heart of the Deep South, raised by a couple of uncles who were soldiers on the Confederate Army, mm -hmm. neighbors with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. So he grew up in the heart of hate, really, and he turned into a man who, who not only took the job of, of mentoring Larry Doby, but would go out of his way to sing his praises. So I really admire and respect someone who's able to show that sort of personal growth because the history of baseball is littered with guys who never did. Yep. Yeah. And you talk about his, his chief rival in his career being Cobb and Cobb has got the lead, the, you know, the legend it remains to be seen how true it is, but whether yeah, Cobb I think, ever made I think, any of those uh, adjustments in his personal life, um, yeah, the, the legend may be harsh, but there was, I think, uh, there's a lot more growth in uh, Speaker than there ever was in Cobb. Yep, yep, yep. So you mentioned the doubles record, and I, I didn't bring that up. Um, the Major League Baseball record for doubles is still held by Trish Speaker 100 years later. Yeah, um, and, and nobody's kept, especially close. I went through the numbers. Uh, Pete Rose is number two. I think he was like 50 or 60 short, but Pete Rose played several more years than Speaker played. Yeah. Um, Pujols was actually not that far. He's about 100 off. Yeah. Um, Pujols played 22 seasons, as did Speaker. Um, the leader, and Speaker has, what, 790 or something 92, like that? I think. Yeah. And so the leader in active doubles is um, uh, Freddie Freeman, who's played yeah. 15 seasons, probably has maybe five left. Um, but he's nowhere close. He's like 300 short. So I think yeah. Speakers, they talk about records that will never be broken. And uh, I guess Ty Cobb is probably the, 
it's not that tough, but Cy Young is probably the number one. Cy, Cy Young number. will forever be the, the most unbreakable record in the game. But yes, there's there's different tiers, and I think Speaker's definitely in the safe tier. Yeah, he's definitely safe. So uh, this is a baseball card show, so let's look let's at some it. baseball cards. Um, this it's, it's easy to go through my Speaker collection because it's literally one card. <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny enough, though, it's, it's one card I don't have. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, um, if you look at it, as you can see, there's a gigantic crease. It's not even a crease. I think at one point it was a fold. Somebody <laughs> folded this card in half. Yeah. Um, and then they took a scissor to the left and right borders, um, <laughs> making this card uh, highly affordable for me. Yes. Um, uh, my friend Matt, who I'm not sure if you know Matt, that well but matt and i have done a bunch of shows together and i was with him in the philly show i don't know three four years ago uh when he bought this card and i think a two and he paid you know paid a, he was looking at a very nice two yeah and he paid up for it um but it's an expensive card i can tell you i don't really talk about money on this channel but um i bought this card at the hofstra show uh for three hundred dollars You'll never find it cheaper than that. And so I was like, ah, you know, 300 I pay. I, I don't know, so I went into one of the tobacco groups on Facebook and I said, um, what do you guys think? And the guys are like, 300 we'll give you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you did well. So, yeah. and the funny thing is the, the dealer who I bought it from, I bought a few cards from him over the years. He's at all the local New York shows and he goes to Philly and stuff. And he has a lot of a lot of pre-war, a lot of Tito sixes, um, and so I think he was stuck with it because I think his sticker price was three fifty, and I talked him down to three hundred. And then somebody sent me a link. the The card had been purchased on eBay in like two thousand eighteen or nineteen for three hundred dollars. So he sat <laughs> on it for for a number of years, He's trying to get his money back. Huh? Got back what he paid for it. So. I feel like it did pretty well. But anyway, this is Speakers. It's a 19, I guess it can't be a 09. Well, it could be 09 because he came up and played it, in 08. But he yeah. wasn't great in 08. He was he it, was, he was was himself in 09. Yeah. It, it's most likely 20, uh, 1910. A lot yeah. of the 350 series backs were made in 20, or get my decades wrong here, 1910. Right. Um, he didn't have a lot of... Stuff that would predate that in any other sets. That seems to be kind of when he made his breakthrough, at least as far as cards are concerned. Yeah, yeah. So this is the part of the reason it's so expensive is because it is a Hall of Fame rookie card. Yeah. Um. So that's the that's the bottom line. And yeah, we uh we saw a chart, or I saw it, and I think it was in our chat of um somebody had posted what years certain um issues backs and and factories were were issued, yeah. and nobody's checked it except to say that it doesn't seem to be wrong in any yeah. respect. So I, I didn't go through and check the, the 350 30 um, for this card, but yeah, it's probably 10. Um, that's the best guess on this one. So that's his only Tito six card. Some, some players have as many as four. A lot of guys have multiple, but speaker only has this one and it is yeah. a glorious card too. That's it his bad yeah. and the, and the, and the blue. So yeah. that's my, uh, that's my massive Trish speaker collection. <laughs> one card. It's beautiful. But I guess it's the one card to have, right? If you're going to have Absolutely. If you're going to have one, that that's a good one to start with. But uh, let me take that back cuz we got some nice ones here. <laughs> um I'm a big fan of the Sporting Life set. Yeah. I think it's underrated and underpriced. Uh as I say that, I'm sure the prices will start going up. Um yeah. and so what's the story? See, I've never seen this portrait before, so I'm curious as to what the story is with Speaker in the Sporting Life set. Yeah, so anybody who's familiar with the set, you notice, generally speaking, you've either got the pastel back or the blue back, but Speaker's got kind of a muted gray back. So uh, when the set was originally produced, it was meant to be 240 cards. Um, obviously, it was quite popular because the, they eventually expanded it to 300. And the last 60 were considered short prints, and they all got their gray back like the speaker does. So um, not a lot of prominent names in that last 60. I think Joe Wood is the other big name. But, but yeah, the Trist speaker was a, a late addition to the set, and uh, honestly, it's a beautiful portrait. I wish they would have made that in a T206 as well. Yeah, yeah that would have been great in a T206. So I noticed it's an A, but it's super sharp. Um, yeah. 
What do you think? Is it oh. trim? No, it, it. I've measured it out. It measures true, at least as far as I can do within the, the case. But if you look on the back, right up here at the top, oh. there, someone wrote the number 23 on it. Oh, okay. So that is the only blemish, the only scuff that I've been able to see on the card. And uh, I, I think I got an outstanding copy because of it. I'd never be able to afford it in this condition without that uh, that little mark on the back. Yeah, I know. I um, I got a Sporting Life Addy Joss um, that I've shown off it on this channel, I don't know, six months ago maybe. And uh, I know what I paid for it. And it was like a, I think it's like a five or four or five. It's a really high grade. Yeah. And I know how expensive it was. And it's not a short print. So this is a short print speaker. I can imagine what you would pay for like a, a numbered version. Yeah, of it, it was, uh, it hurt a little bit. Well, you know. <laughs> but I got the great card in return, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, you got the great card and you paid, you paid hopefully a number. Numbers for an, for an authentic rather than numbers for what this well, card would be yes. if it was rated as a, as a five or six, yeah. um, which would break the bank. But, uh, you know, buy the card, not the grade. So there you go. Absolutely. And to the right, we have um, a 1915 American Caramel. We talked off camera. I'm not really actually familiar with this. And I went and pulled my Sam Crawford American Caramel, which is a completely different year. But so what's the story with this guy? Yeah, so this happens to be my absolute favorite speaker card. Um, yeah, it's a. I love the colors on it. They just explode off the card. It's beautiful. Um, it's an image. They first used it in the E ninety dash one set. Mm -hmm. That's another one that's considered to be a speaker rookie card. Right. Um, they reissued it in nineteen fifteen with the American Caramel. There's also an obscure tobacco set that's got one or two copies of it. Uh, I think it's a T212, but I might be wrong about that one. But it's just, it's an incredibly beautiful card. It's a very rare card, too. I think combined between all three sets, PSA is graded 50 of them. Mm -hmm. So very hard to find. Very hard to find in this condition, too. The only reason it's a 1.5, I'm not sure if I can get it on the camera or not here. Let me, let me get it to you. Yeah, yeah. There's a little tiny bit of red just above his shoe there, right there. Uh huh. And it doesn't appear on most other copies of the card. So I think it's just a little bit of bit of ink from someone spilled on it. And that's oh. the only reason it's a 1.5 because it's got sharp corners. There's no creasing. It's glossy. Uh, it's a really beautiful what's, example what's, of the card. What's on the back? What's on the back? It's just an ad for the American Caramel okay. Company. All right, because I had the, the e, E90, I guess it is, E90-1 that I have at Crawford has a very similar kind of card with the, you know, the yellow. Yeah, it's got the baseball bats on the back, right? Background, but it has, the one thing I love about it is it has um, a checklist on the back. Oh, right, yeah. It's like got all the players on it, which is cool. Um, so we move on to um, this page, which we got six cards here. The the. The American Caramels on the upper right, I know them. I have cards from those sets. There's a Willard's. There's yep. Oxford Confectionery, which I don't have a card from. Uh, and then there's, the, of course, the T207. Um, but the, the card that, that intrigues me the most is the bottom left, because I have no idea what that is. That one is, it's an R&J Hill. It's a British, I believe it's a tobacco company. Um 1934 issue. I know don't normally collect uh, outside of a player's playing days, but I made an exception for this one because I think it's got a kind of a really cool backstory behind it. Okay. Um, for anybody who's particularly astute, you'll notice he's wearing a Chicago White Sox uniform in that picture, which, as you talked about in his bio, he never played for the White Sox. Right. So uh, what happened was at the end of the 1913 season, uh, John McGraw and Charlie Kaminsky got together and decided we could still make some more money on our respective ball teams. We're going to do a world tour. And when they set that up, they each grabbed a couple of ringers from other teams around the league. And Tris Speaker was recruited by Charlie Kaminsky to join the White Sox. Oh, okay. So it was a very substantial tour. They, they started off in San Francisco. They went west to Hawaii, Australia, Japan, India, Egypt, Italy, France, England, over to New York, and basically got home about a week before training camp started. But but the interesting part was the the photo on this card was taken at a 
I don't know what the name of the stadium is, but it's a British stadium. So uh, he played in the UK. The right. card was issued in the UK, which is why I made the exception to buy it. But uh, just kind of a neat story because, again, Tris Speaker on the White Sox, nobody would understand why that <laughs> happened in the first place. Um, and the other, the other neat side note about that, too, I kind of talked about his background being raised in the South. Uh, one of the, the lifelong grudges he held was he hated Catholics. And oh, that's part, right. Right. As that was part, part of, the, of the world tour, yeah. uh, they made a side trip to the Vatican and everybody got to meet the Pope. And I would give any amount of money to know what was going through the speaker's head that day because uh, he would have hated every minute of it. Yeah, he's that's actually it's funny. I, I, I'm a Boston Irish Catholic. <laughs> My yeah. father's side, entire side to Boston. So uh, he was on the Red Sox. And I think I, I was reading this that there was. There was a rift between the Catholic players and the Protestant players, which you know, today there, there very much was. Yes, it was. I mean, he you talk about a fish out of water, a Southern Confederate, uh, the probably the worst city to play baseball in in those days for him would have been Boston, yeah. highly Irish Catholic, very religious. Um, he I, there were definitely rifts in the, the dugout, and uh, reading the biography of Tris Speaker, there were certain guys he latched on to, so uh. Joe Wood was a lifelong friend of his. He was another Protestant, so they kind of gravitated together, and yeah, they were good. forever at war with the, the Catholics on the team. And But, you know, it, it's funny because he was well-liked in Boston. Yes. He, he did ads. He was like one of those guys that in the early days did advertising. Like he was a spokesman yeah. for something. And, and, I mean, he's, he did community stuff too. So it's yeah. like I guess he liked Boston in some respects but didn't like it. In other yeah, respects. and I think he's just one of those naturally charming, easygoing people that uh, just friends with everybody the moment he meets them, so very easy to get along with. But, uh, yeah, he was prone to his blow-ups over the religious issues, I guess, of the day. So we have uh, Willard's Chocolate, which is um, – is that a Canadian issue? It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, made in Brantford, Ontario, I believe. How far are you from Brantford? Uh, by about – an hour and a quarter drive. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there's not much reason to go there. There's not a whole lot going on in Brantford <laughs> these days, but uh, I know where it is, and I'm not too far away. That's that's cool. Um, and then you've got uh, the E120. Yep. Which? Uh, how many? Uh, I have a couple of these. It uh, the back tells you how many cards are in the set, right? Uh, the back is the the team checklist. Oh, it's the team it's checklist. Got okay. All the uh, the Cleveland Indians on there. Oh, there you go. Okay, all right. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of guys that uh, that he brought with him from Boston when he became manager of Cleveland. So he got Joe Wood is on here. Right. Uh, Larry Gardner was another one that followed him out of Boston. Kind of he rescued his Protestant friends. Yeah, Joe Wood. Um, it's interesting because he came to Cleveland not being able to pitch, and then became yes. a, a pretty not a great outfielder, but a pretty decent outfielder. And that's, I guess, the speaker was part of that. Yeah. Um, Joe Wood then, has kind of a uh, unique distinction too. He's uh, he's one of only two players to ever start a World Series game as a pitcher and as an outfielder. The right. only other guy to do it was Babe Ruth. Yep. And then we got the one twenty one. I think is next to that. Yeah. That's another American caramel. Do I have a 121? Yeah, I have a 121 over here, Moranville. Um, yeah. who, what, now, that's the back that says how many cards is in it, right? It's like Yeah, the All-Star Baseball Series of 80. 80, okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. There's about six different varieties of this one, and uh, you get the different sizes of the projection, and whether it's the abbreviation for manager or the full word spelled out or not mentioned at all, so... It's and then you an got interesting the, rabbit hole to go down if you want to build out a full master set. Yes, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. And then we got uh, the T two O seven of the Browns, which I like. It's a recruit back, right? Hold on, yes. Let me get, get you closer on here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, these yep. you can't you gotta love these cards. Absolutely, it's it's one of those yeah. sets I think that really gets slides under the radar because the the biggest name is Walter Johnson. It's such an ugly card that. People look at that and say, I can't possibly collect that set. It's horrible. But yeah, when you look past Walter Johnson, there's a lot of really nice cards in there. I have the Zach Wheat, and I have um, uh, Mar Sands, the uh, Cuban player. Yep. 
and um i'm sorry um i have another one. Oh, oh, jack quinn so i have a few of them and they're they're nice cards i don't know why they yeah, yeah i guess it's because of the uh some of the portraits are and, some of the and portraits are bad and the checklist right. has got a few big names that are missing but uh and then we've got the opportunity if you don't care the oxford confectionery yeah which is a nice card it's a nice little face facial shot there yeah it's a really cool set you've kind of noticed that there's some image repetition in a lot of my cards yeah but the oxford confectionery every one of these cards has a, a picture that i've never seen used on yep. on any other set so well kind that's of a, a nice change of pace not just your cards it's the 1920s they use the same photos so well, yeah you, you can see the the two of pictures of him batting and i've got another exhibit card with him batting as well that just every yeah we're, getting, we're, yeah. we're gonna move on to that but i was gonna say that you know my episode last week uh with the zach wheat collector uh, greg and and you yeah. know they used the same zach wheat photo <laughs> and yeah. was, one of the slides was the same photo on three photo different photo. cards yeah <laughs> All right, so here we got some nice looking exhibit cards. Um, yeah, yeah. So, kind of as I mentioned, this is the one that's been repeated. Probably his most used photo on uh, on any card that he's got. This is the nineteen twenty two Eastern exhibits. Yeah, another really cool, sneaky under the radar set that a lot of people don't know about. I think it's only twenty cards deep, but they're all they're all Hall of Famers and superstars. Yep, and, and I like that. I like the sepia kind of look to it. Yeah. Um, and then the 27 exhibits are also, um, they're pretty well renowned, the 27 exhibits. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think I have a couple of cards from this set. But yeah, this is the, that's a beautiful card. Yeah. Speak, we should mention his center field play. Yes. Because he started off in the dead ball era and he was a smart guy. Yeah. He spent a lot of time playing really, really shallow. And he holds a lot of records um, still. For like put outs, he, he uh, you know, unassisted double plays, things like that. Yeah. And even when the ball started livening up in the early 20s, um, he still played shallow. Yeah. And he kind of um he kind of mastered that going back on the ball, which he had to do. So he and, he and, and, sir, sir, go ahead. Don't mean to catch off. He, he sort of he's a precursor to the modern players that played super shallow. Um, yeah. Like, Gary Maddox and Paul Blair, guys like that, who who learned how to go he, back on the ball so well. He was actually, if you can believe it, on multiple occasions in his career, he was the pivot man on a double play. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't know the last time I saw a a six eight three double play, but it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> but but what he would do actually when he was the manager in Cleveland. In a bunt situation, he told both the first and third baseman to charge the ball. He told the second baseman and the shortstop to to cover first and third, respectively, and then he played second. He would yeah. run in and cover the second base. So uh, he, that was just kind of the – speaks to his range and his intelligence, really. But, yeah, he just played impossibly shallow, and this, nothing seemed to fly over his head. And then there's the uh, – let's see, there's a 21 exhibits. Yeah. This one's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you may, some people will recognize it. This image was also used in the 1940 play ball. Yeah. Which is one of the ugliest cards ever made because they basically airbrushed his entire face. Yeah. Which, so I won't be buying that card. I hate it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, you talk another recycled image and they, they really botched it on that one, but the exhibit is gorgeous. I mean, I spent a lot of time talking about this that, as much as I like to do complete runs of players, if they have a card that just like turns me off, I, I won't I won't have it. I just won't yeah. buy it. So or or I'll get it somehow and then sell it. So yeah, that uh, that's that's for another episode. But anyway, so we got uh, three beautiful exhibit cards, and uh, I think we've come to the end, right? Yeah, we've come that, to the end. That's it. Yeah. Um, so it's the Fleischmann's Bakery, which is nineteen sixteen. Yes. So 16 is the year he ends up in Cleveland, right? Is that the, that, is, that is, yeah. I think that might be his first shot as a as a member of the Cleveland Indians. Yeah, so uh, they didn't get a top airbrush hat, but we got a hat that doesn't have a team on it. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's by far the scarcest card in my collection. It's yeah. there's a population total population between PSA and SGC of 5. <laughs> and uh, 
this happens to be the highest graded. I stumbled across it at Heritage and uh, got it for far too low, but I'm not complaining. It's yeah. A really beautiful card, presents well, and it's a great shot of them. Well, if you got it on Heritage, Heritage is a uh, little, little high end for my taste sometimes, uh, for my bank account sometimes. I have bought from Heritage, but. Um... I don't, I don't spend a lot of time there because I'm, they price me out a lot. So I don't know what yeah. you spent on it, but uh, it's, um, yeah. it's, a, it was, it's a beautiful card. And if you're, yeah, if, it was, pop, if you're pop one highest. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was one of those ones. I, like I said, I got very lucky. It was a very big T206 auction. So all eyes were on the T206s that were available. This was kind of a one-off. There was, I think, there was maybe one other Fleischman there, but it wasn't getting any billing or any attention, right? And I, I, I don't want to get into what I spent on it. It's publicly available, but uh, I got it for. I had done the comps beforehand. There was one that last one had sold in 2018 was a one, and when the hammer fell on this one, I had paid less than the sell the buyer in 2018 for a lesser yeah. card. Oh wow, 18 and a yeah, one. yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, it happens sometimes, you know. It does. It's just I just fluke luck, but I I've had really a few of those in, in in the REA auctions where um, you know, page 28 has like the third highest, you know, 57 mantle, but it's a four and a half and I paid like, you know, I don't know, 2 300 dollars less than the last yeah. one. You know, I love that. So finally we have what is I guess it's mint 9 is the is the um is the autograph yeah, uh, great on this because it's a cut. It's a cut card. I can see his his cap is cut a little bit on the top. What what is that picture? Is it um? I think it's just a photograph. It doesn't. It's not an image I've seen anywhere else. I right. Don't recognize it from any other cards. It's just. Uh, I'll just highlight the autograph here. It's just the a, auto. Yeah, it's a great shot. But you know, you compare this to. I don't want to pick on modern day players because they sign tens of thousands of autographs every year. But you talk about beautiful signatures, and uh, yeah. I think this speaker with the blue fountain pen has got to be right up at the top of the list for best looking. That is a good one. Um, I think the best pre-war signature out there is Charlie Geringer. Yeah, his is gorgeous. <laughs> Charlie Geringer. Yeah. Perfect handwriting, and it's perfect. amazing. Yeah, the mechanical man, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he signed a lot. And speaker, so speaker, as I said in the intro, made a post playing days career out of being Tris speaker. Yes. Um, so I guess he was around baseball a lot. He probably, did he sign a lot other? I, I'm sure he would have. He, he yeah. seemed like a very gracious type of guy that I'm, I'm sure he spent a lot of time signing autographs for kids. And he had some health issues later on in his life. He didn't, he didn't live that long. I think he lived into his, uh, he died at 70. If I recall. Yeah. He was not one of those guys who lasted forever. Um, so we'll go back to, yeah, he died in 1958 at the age of 70, correct. Interestingly enough, uh, buried in his hometown. Uh, yes. In, in the plot with his parents in Hubbard, Texas. So born, raised, and died and buried in Hubbard, Texas. So Yeah. Anyway, so um, that is the sixth highest war and fifth, if you don't count Barry Bonds, uh, player of all time. Uh, yeah. speaker who um you know i'm sure you will continue to collect and i you know i really uh i really do have to get some some more than the just the one card <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. it's like you get a pc going and you got so many different i got so many different pcs i got this set i'm working on them this player i'm working on them you know yeah. it, it, it's almost like nothing has found its way to me <laughs> speaker card yeah. in, in the 1920s, like one of those exhibits, you know, finds its way to me somehow, and it's all you know. I see it; it's good. I'll get one. So eventually, I'll I'll, I'll flesh out a little more than the one card uh, speaker. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, my friend, thank you for coming on. I know well, thank you. Thank you for having me again. Somewhere, somewhere to go, and um, I should mention that your 1952. We will have the follow up show. <laughs> Uh, how, yes. many, how many cards are we up to now? Uh, just over 150. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't remember so we when, we were the bigger when, we, too. when we did the show. I think it was around 140, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, yeah. We'll get up. It's funny because I got you 
and I got my friend Jim Ector, who's doing the um, 33 Gowdy set, and he's close. Uh, and I'm like, rooting for you. So that way, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so I will be in Strongsville next week on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to try to pre record a show during the week and then put it on Saturday. The week after that, I have uh, the Ali Reynolds show with Mark Del Franco. The week after that, I have, I believe, um, I think it's the Jimmy Fox show. And then I have the Phil Rizzuto show has been confirmed. I think it's for May 13th. So we got a lot of good stuff coming up. And then the one year anniversary show, I think is going to be on Saturday, like the, whatever the 12th, 13th in there. I'm going to do a two hour live. And of course you will be invited to the live. I haven't sent the email out, but I'm going to invite everyone who's been on this show to come on the live and uh, spend a little time with everybody talk updating on what, what what we've got since the last kind of show so we're, it's going to be a um kind of like a, a review of the year with like what's coming up in the in the future so i'm really looking forward to that but uh anyway so folks we will see you next week um i'm not sure what the show is going to be when i pre-record there's a couple of possibilities one is that i have an sgc sub that's been there too long that i'm hoping comes in early this week and the other one is um this uh john mangini has a um a video response thing where you have to find a card from a set that he doesn't have so i'm going to go through my cards and maybe try to figure out a set that mangini doesn't have anyway thanks sean again great to see you i'll see you in the chat and um folks we'll see you next week <laughs>